Britain's national treasure. 68% of the UK believe the institution is good for the country. Oh, it's fantastic! <laughs> when there is a royal event and people flock just to catch a glimpse, there's a little bit of magic in that, isn't there? In an era that increasingly values merit over birth, has the concept of a royal family grown outdated? Trooping the colour, the Queen's official birthday celebration and the greatest parade of each year in Britain. Or do an adoring public at home? It's the stalwart symbol of what it means to be British. And away. Remain loyal. There were at least a million people on the streets to see the Queen. I suppose the main benefit of the royal family is that it provides stability in a changing world. As royal commentators dispel the myth of the monarchy. They ended up with the king doing the conga round the staterooms of Buckingham Palace. Experts will break down key archive from crucial moments in royal history. It was a fairy tale created by the Grimm brothers. So prepare to discover what actually happens when blue blood runs red. What have you been doing in here all day? This is The Royals Revealed. In this episode, we reveal the money the royal family receive is on the up. At the time, an MP famously described it as a golden ratchet. The money would always go up, but never down. The royals carry out 3,500 engagements a year. It seems like people are getting a good bang for their buck. But in an uncertain financial climate... This is a huge amount of money draining away from the public purse. With all the private planes, trains and pimped-up automobiles, well, the Queen is the most travel monarch in all history. Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip board a plane for the 30,000-mile tour around the world. Not to mention the pomp. The royals are like celebrities. When they wear a certain brand of something and we like it, we all want to wear that too or have a bit of that too, that royal sparkle. Palaces. How did she get those? particular properties which are allegedly privately owned. She got them because Queen Victoria and Prince Albert went to Parliament cap in hands. Parliament increased the amount of money they gave to the Queen. What she did was use that extra money to buy Sandringham and Balmoral, which therefore ought to belong to the state. And pageantry that comes with the territory. One of the things that about Elizabeth that I've never seen contradicted is the sense that she puts duty first almost to an, an insane degree. Are they truly worth it? It's a bad deal for, in terms of value for money and the taxpayer uh, getting ripped off. Today, Forbes estimate the wealth of the royal family to be £70 billion. Whilst that might be almost incomprehensible to most people, when the average family lives on just over £30,000 a year, it's not just about the money to us commoners, it's about the age-old principles. Certainly, I think the British look to the monarchy as a beacon of continuity and stability, and because they transcend politics, there's this sense that you're safe with them. That was especially important during the war. Um, famously, uh, the Queen Mother, when told by her courtiers and the government, look, you must, you must leave the country. She said, um, well, uh, the King won't leave London, and so we're not leaving London. And many people have said that that gave the royal family at least a century of credit with the British public. The sense of security the royal family brought the nation was symbolised by a show of splendour at Queen Elizabeth's coronation. It was sprinkling some, you know, royal fairy dust on the nation, you know, made everyone happy. So it probably justified paying a bit more, bit more money on it in order to make everyone much happier. I was a kid, I saw the coronation, and what really came off at the time of coronation was sweets. Uh, which pleased everybody, sweets and biscuits. Though some might argue the expense was elaborate in such austere times. People were on rations just after the Second World War in the run-up to the coronation, but actually the cash was splashed a bit to cheer people up after what had been a really difficult period and have this focus of Britishness, really, a celebration of the pomp and pageantry, which had been partly responsible for helping the Allies to win the war. And it was a tremendous day, and it was a tremendous start to the Queen's 
to the Queen's reign. And the way to maintain the monarch's new momentum was to get immersed among the masses. Walkabouts were nothing new. Uh, King George V, Queen Mary, did walkabouts during their reign. But for the Queen, it was a novel idea, it was something new, it was something that... It brought her closer to the people, it brought the people closer to her. Throughout her life as the figurehead of the royal brand, the Queen has notched up over 20,000 engagements during her reign providing morale boosts to workforces and the public at large. On a visit to Scotland, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip visit the ancient kingdom of Fife, whole rich for over seven centuries. And to the delight of Scott miners, descend Roth's Pit, newest of the Fife collieries. It's the first time the Queen has ever gone down into a mine. A novel and entertaining experience for all concerned. Elizabeth's white coveralls remained almost spotless, testimony to the modernity of the Roth's mind. She knows that there may be occasions when people see her for one time in their life and talk about it for years afterwards, so she wants to make that memorable. She has made it her mission to be so and has encouraged other members of the royal family to be as transparent and obvious as she has been so that people feel that they're getting their money's worth and that they're getting to see the royals in action. She is that one constant figure and I think when you see someone embedded in the culture, you actually get used to them. That They're a trust figure, they're part of the furniture. She's kept abreast with social, economic and political matters in weekly audiences with 14 prime ministers and ensured the UK remained in close contact with hundreds of heads of state. De Gaulle's visit is a major public event as well, a high ceremonial occasion. With the Queen, he rides in an open carriage escorted by the household cavalry and full regalia to the palace through streets lined with curious and cheering Londoners. One of the things that about Elizabeth that I've never seen contradicted is the sense that she puts duty first, almost to an, <laughs> an insane degree. You know, when you think she's in her 90s and she's still perhaps managing two or 300 public engagements a year, it's extraordinary. But whilst all this hard work is clearly vital in terms of maintaining a national identity, and the emotional and economic stability that it can be seen to bring. All the public-facing activities come at a price, which some are finding increasingly harder to stomach. The question of whether the royals are worth it is certainly nothing new, and so throughout her lengthy reign, the Queen has ensured her family are always seen to do their bit for society. And supporting the community, has always been top of the agenda. It was to aid the fund for building a vestry at Crathy Church near Balmoral that members of the royal family and their household helped at a sale of work at Abergeldy Castle. The Queen herself acted as a seller. What a terrific thrill for the customers. Princess Margaret was in charge of another section of the stall and the Duke of Edinburgh, who proved a very brisk salesman, had a joke for every buyer. I think few would be able to resist the opportunity to see the Queen if she was visiting locally. Yes, there are Republicans that aren't interested in the monarchy at all, although few of them find fault with the Queen as an individual um, because she famously hasn't really ever put a foot wrong. Um, but there's a sense that everyone wants to be able to say, I saw the Queen once and she said this or she did that. Um, People want to capture that moment. But in order to carry out these duties, the Queen has been entitled to an annual chunk of cash, which has been on the rise for over 250 years. In 1760, the government came to an arrangement with George III, whereby uh, the royal lands were handed over to the public. Uh, and in return for that, uh, the king at the time was granted money each year to meet his expenses, called the civil list. That existed until uh, really just a few years ago, 2012, when it was replaced by something called the Sovereign Grant. At the time, an MP famously described it as a golden ratchet. The money would always go up, but never down. And so it's proved. The civil list, for example, in 2011, was 7.9 million pounds a year. By 2018, seven years later, it was 82.3 million, uh, the Sovereign Grant. This is at a time of austerity when everybody else was tightening their belts. It's an incredible sum, but what does that equate to for the public? 
The palace say that the cost of the monarchy is only about £1.20 for every citizen of Britain. Now, that's a little bit misleading and indeed a little bit naughty because it just applies to citizens and not the taxpayers. And secondly, the cost of the monarchy is a bit more than the, the formal cost of the sovereign grant, which is about £85 million. When you include all the hidden costs, and particularly security, which could add up another £100 million, the real cost is more like £300 million. So as we present our quickly passed on flowers, flap our Union Jacks, and burst out all the other paraphernalia. There's lots of costs churning away in the background, which the sovereign grant covers. It includes not only salaries for around about 300 people, private secretaries, craftspeople, groomsmen in the Royal Mews to run uh, hospitality. There are garden parties, there are receptions. There are a whole host of things. There are getting the Queen around about the country to do her job. So it's money well spent. However, there's another sizable expense on the balance sheet. So originally the sovereign grant was in the region of £40 million a year. It's more than doubled because they've included the cost of refurbishing Buckingham Palace, which the royal household allowed to uh, fall into rack and ruin over the last 60 years. That will continue to go up. It's, it's likely to hit uh, £100 million over the next few years. But those aren't the only renovations which have caused a Republican backlash. After the fire at Windsor, the government suggested the public should pay for Windsor Castle to be rebuilt and refurbished. And there was no cry. And in the end, the money had to come from uh, the Queen via entrance fees to Buckingham Palace. But when it came to refurbishing Buckingham Palace, £359 million, the taxpayer pays all of that. So about 10, 15% of the grant really is earmarked to going for that refurbishment. At that percentage, it will be around a decade before all the work is done. So in the coming years, the Queen must delegate both cash and royal responsibilities carefully among the rest of the family. I'm not sure whether the public has a complete appreciation for the fact that the royals carry out 3,500 engagements a year, answer 1,000 letters, um, have dozens of audiences with leading figures from around the world. It seems like people are getting a good bang for their buck. Technically, the hardest working royal is Prince Charles, because when the engagements are all clocked up at the end of the year, he pretty much always appears to have carried out the most. The man is a workaholic. He believes in what he's doing. He works incredibly hard. <laughs> but is Charles's coverage of the country as widespread as the quantity suggests? The public, for example, has mapped all the visits that Prince Charles did in one year, and they're all very much focused or clustered around uh, London, around Highgrove in Gloucestershire, and around Balmoral in Scotland. So he doesn't go very far to do these things. It's very much about making sure that he remains in the limelight and that they project some sense of purpose. Charles could be criticised for doing too much. You know, he has been criticised for having too many fingers and too many pies. So the real issue is not just the quantity of engagements, but the quality of the work. So, are the rest of the firm pulling their weight and adding value to society? Princess Anne is always regarded as a legendary royal trooper because she very much likes to pack the engagements in. And indeed, it's not unheard of for Princess Anne to do seven, eight or nine engagements in one day. An impressive stat, yes, but is it perhaps overexposure? People like Princess Anne do diligently go about their business, add value to the charities they support, uh, do so in a conscientious and, and low-key way. The fact of the matter is, however, that the majority of functions are carried out by those who are quite elderly in the royal family. We don't see the same numbers for the junior roles, including Prince William, who carries out barely 200 functions a year. And there will always be debate as to how large a team the Queen can justify. There are currently 16 members of the royal family who are considered working royals, like Princess Alexandra. Who is Princess Alice, for example? Has anyone heard of her? You know, what does Princess Michael of Kent do these days? You know, why do we need these people? In the past, those titles would have meant something even if you didn't recognise them. I think these days, not recognising them uh, would cause most people to think, well, why are we still paying for them? This isn't just a Republican viewpoint. 
After the Queen goes, Charles says he wants to slim down the royal family, which is him and Camilla, Kate and William, and their children with the rest of the royals off the payroll. But for those that still live off the sovereign grant and the general financial security that brings, just to recap, 86 million quid at the last count. They're expected to promote the royal brand with dignity, and usually that will involve a stint in the armed forces. The military is a safe option for the royal family. There's no commercial prerogatives. Um, you, you're kept out of the way. It's always been difficult for members of the royal family to go into business, to go into trade, because people always accuse you of cashing in on your name. But when Prince Edward ditched the Marines for work experience with Andrew Lloyd Webber, it was the start of an uneasy journey into an untried industry for the royal family. It's the lowest rung on the learning process of, of, of working in theatre and uh, he will have no status whatsoever. We will not be using him in any PR capacity, purely as an employee to learn the business. Edward's working ambitions were truly uncharted territory. And what he then seemed to think that he could do was to bring the stage to the royal family, he put them on the stage. And clearly, as far as he was concerned, let's get rid of all the old cobwebs, let's, let, let's show how wonderfully entertaining we all are. His plan was to do a charity remake of a knockabout, a Salt Course TV classic. The Duchess of York was first off the coach, bringing the royal family and their teams to Orton Towers. Prince Edward was already there to meet them, well into the spirit of the day, sporting a silly T-shirt. Royal Knockout was an unmitigated disaster. It was one of those things that, like, maybe on paper, in theory, seemed like a good idea, and then as soon as it was on screen, it quickly became apparent what a bad idea it was. The broadcast footage is now under embargo, Yet body language expert Judy James recalls the impact it had on viewers. It was dreadful for the public because the public wanted to see more of the royal family. And I remember when that was advertised, great, let's see them being funny and everything like that. But when you get what you ask for and it's awful, you know straight away, actually, no, I'd rather have them with their hands behind their back and not speaking too much. Edward's press conference afterwards did little to add merit to the venture. Uh, first of all, I have to apologise if, if I go to sleep at the bottom of this. Media were not allowed to watch proceedings live. We had to watch it on television. And it was a cold day, it was in a tent, there were no refreshments. And Edward came in at the end of it and sat at a table, sort of slightly raised, and looked at the assembled crowd of media and said, well, what did you think of it? And I know the captains have enjoyed themselves. I only hope that you've enjoyed yourselves. Have you? You could have heard a pin drop. Well, thanks for sounding so bloody enthusiastic. <laughs> what have you been doing in here all day? <laughs> have you been watching it? Yeah. yeah. What did you think of it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. The headline the next day was, it's a walkout. Um, which just about summed it up. I think Edward had set himself up to be a, a champion in his own right. This was his star of the royal family. His brothers had been heroes, they'd been in the armed forces, etc. but he was going to do it theatrically and do this wonderful show that everybody would love him and the royal family would say, oh, no, Edward, you are now the most famous member of the royal family, and it didn't quite work out like that. I suppose it's difficult being the fourth um, son of the monarch. You don't really have a role, you have to create one for yourself. After an ill-fated foray into TV production, Edward was ultimately brought back in line as a working royal. There's this sense you've got to behave properly because you've got to be accountable. You've got to show that you're dutiful above all else, almost to the point sometimes where you've got to sacrifice your private life for duty. And that's a very difficult thing for, for many people. I mean, the royals are only human after all. It's, it's no easier for them to do that than it would be for any of the rest of us who are not in the spotlight. Recently, the Queen's grandson, Peter Phillips, also fell foul in trying to do his own thing. They're entitled to their private people, but what is wrong is when they then invoke the royal name to boost their commercial uh, activities. Peter Phillips was busy uh, selling milk to the Chinese and uh, pretending it all came from Windsor and uh, the royal family drink this every morning and so on. Uh, that was an attempt to uh, 
use his uh, links with the royal family for commercial activities. That's entirely improper. One necessary activity for working royals is to represent the UK abroad. And whilst news reports may focus on how they sample regional delicacies, don the local dress, and generally embrace the culture, there's lots of crucial work going on off camera. Ever since before she ascended the throne, the Queen has been instilling royal values all over the world. Well, the Queen is the most travel monarch in all history, and because she is the head of the Commonwealth as well as head of state in the UK, she needs to travel to Commonwealth countries to make sure that those countries appreciate the fact that they're seeing their Queen in the flesh. The royal family are our secret weapon in selling the UK abroad. Various governments abroad in foreign countries are more likely to take note of the United Kingdom if there's a member of the royal family on their doorstep rather than some dishevelled politician. They can see politicians any time. They can't see the royal family at any time. It's absolutely right, of course, that the Queen and members of the royal family travel abroad to represent this country. However, some members of the royal family believe that, first of all, they do not have to use uh, commercial uh, airlines, but they must travel by private jet at vast cost to the taxpayer. People perhaps think that this is excessive. I would say the counter-argument to that is you can't expect the Queen necessarily to go on easy jet. At its peak, the annual travel spend was a whopping 18 million. These days, it's nearer to three or four. But besides flights, how do they spend so much? They always take large teams with them, including hairdressers, including dresses and, and valets. Um, and of course, they have a whole press team. So this rapidly becomes a very expensive venture compared, for example, to an ambassador or politician who would cost a fraction of that because they wouldn't, simply wouldn't get away with taking that kind of um, team with them. And let's not even get started on the outfits. I mean, the royals don't do capsule wardrobes. The Canada leg of this tour, 6,000 kilometres, approximately 50 separate events and, of course, 40 outfits. There may be a job in the morning that requires trousers, an afternoon job that requires a floaty summer dress, and in the evening, full white tie attire. This is a world away from a typical family holiday. It's a family holiday multiplied by, in, by the hundreds. Whilst it may seem to cost the earth for the royals to travel the globe, it's all about adding deeper value to the union at large. Absolutely, it's a way of maintaining um, shared history. Also, it gives a morale boost to countries to see royalty there. It also um, serves to keep ideas of republicanism at bay. Australia's flirted with the idea of republicanism. Canada's flirted with the idea of it. And it's no s surprise, perhaps, that both of those countries have recently been visited by high-profile royals, including the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and their children. They made it real. They, they brought the monarchy to the people. With such strong international relations to withhold, it's been integral for the Queen to ensure her representatives maintain her good name. But financial controversies in the recent past have seen the notion of royal entitlements come under fire. In examining the costs around the royal family, Global travel expenses invariably enter the debate. The prince doesn't pay for his trips to exotic places, but then he couldn't afford to. He hasn't been well off by royal standards, but today it gets better. He'll have a full £20,000 a year from the Queen's civil list for a start. And one man who became central to that was Prince Andrew. The Duke of York was nicknamed Air Miles Andy for his propensity to rack up private jet travel on jobs that some people suggested might not have been particularly useful to Britain. I asked a parliamentary question after one particularly uh, excessive year of travel by Prince Andrew as to what particular trade deals he had uh, managed to put together in his role as trade envoy. The government couldn't name one. Meanwhile, the expenses could be quantified. Some of these trips were quite extraordinary in the cost. The, you know, £100,000 or more for a flight to or trip to the United States, 30000 for a visit to Japan. In the last year that he was in this official role, it was more than £600,000 in the year spent on uh, travel costs 
alone. I once went to Mexico for an interview that I did with him to mark his 50th birthday. There was a huge entourage, and to be fair, there's a massive kidnapping risk in Mexico City, but you've never seen a motorcade like it. And I did get the impression that Prince Andrew quite enjoyed the notion of being centre of attention and almost seeming presidential. Most famously, he demanded that his valet bring with him a six-foot ironing board. So you got the ludicrous situation of some royal lackey having to carry it out of the plane into the waiting um, Land Rover or whatever. Even back in drizzly old Blighty, the jet setting continued. He's become known as Air Miles Andy. This private jet is taking the Duke of York to Newcastle. Bad weather had grounded the royal helicopter. It was a reminder of repeated accusations of extravagance. Did you have to go by private jet to Newcastle? Yeah, because there was no other way of getting there and back, bearing in mind from what I was doing before and what I was doing afterwards. Well, there was this sense as well that Prince Andrew kept on taking helicopters to go short distances and private jets when surely a commuter train, God forbid, would have sufficed. Um, this idea of him being quite grandiose and dismissing the notion of um, taking scheduled flights because he was very important as the Queen's son sort of cast a cloud over everything that he was doing. Eyebrows were also raised in the manner of which he conducted his leisure time. There was one occasion when he went to Northern Ireland to Port Rush um, when he played a golf match, and because it took a bit longer than expected, he was an hour late to be guest of honour at an event which he should have been attending in his royal capacity. And I know for a fact that some of his aides had to take him aside and say, seriously, you cannot take the golf clubs on these trips. It's completely the wrong look. You're there to do an official job on behalf of the Queen, not enjoy 18 holes at St Andrews. Ultimately, with mounting criticism, Andrew retired from his roving role in 2011. A reported £57 million bank balance makes him the third richest royal. But the cost to his reputation, after a much-published acquaintance with one business associate, may well be harder to quantify. So understandably, Andrew has been told to step back from royal duties to have essentially zero public presence because of the continuing allegations that hang over his head in relation to his relationship with Epstein. Even though Andrew denies any wrongdoing, he wouldn't be the only team member in the top tier to be relegated to the reserves in the last year, as Prince Harry faced his own financial backlash, when he and Meghan set about renovating Frogmore Cottage. The bill seemed quite hefty for the size of property that it was, 2.4 million. I think comparatively, when the Cambridges renovated their apartment at Kensington Palace, which is a 20-bed palatial mansion, it cost just over four. So people started scratching their heads, looking at the arithmetic and thinking, goodness me, Harry and Meghan haven't scrimped here. Then, of course, they then abandoned their uh, roles that they had... Uh, taken on and decided not to use the cottage full-time, but still expected the taxpayer to fund it. What most people don't like about the royal family is when they want it both ways. This happened with the departure of Prince Harry and Meghan. Initially, what Harry wanted was to have a hybrid royal, to be half in, half out, i.e. to receive some money from the sovereign grant, at the same time to be able to earn a living independently. Now, the two things really don't go together. I think that most people in this country, your ordinary hard-working uh, families up and down the UK, would think that having £30 million in the bank makes you financially independent. So the whole thing was a farce. As the Duke and Duchess did away with their HRH titles, which they'd only had for barely 18 months, they ended a temporary residence in the Commonwealth country of Canada and moved to LA, where they're currently hauled up in a palatial Beverly Hills pad Market value, roughly £18 million. So what of Harry and Meghan's earning potential stateside? They'll be able to command six, seven-figure fees for uh, making keynote speeches, for uh, being directors of various companies, for writing their own books, if they wish. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't worry about Meghan and Harry making a few bob. 
In fact, they've just signed a multi-year deal with streaming channel Netflix for reportedly £112 million. But even these eye-watering sums is small change compared to the biggest royal earners. As the Queen and Prince Charles control most of the family fortune. The Duchy of Lancaster is the Queen's ancestral estate. It's a really a portfolio of land, mainly in Lancashire and Yorkshire. But the thing is, in recent years, the profits from that land have really gone up enormously. In 1760, when most of the Crown lands were handed over to the government uh, in return for uh, the civil list being created for George III, the Duchy of Lancaster was somehow overlooked. It was only worth £16 a year uh, in those days. Now it's worth £533 million a year and produces an income stream for the Queen for her private use. Yet only two royal properties are personally owned by the Queen. First, the sprawling 115 million Scottish getaway, Balmoral. The Queen famously spends about two months of the year up in Balmoral, um, and other members of the family like to go to their country estates. So it's a very difficult thing to keep a balancing act between, on the one hand, connecting with the mass of the population, which is their role, and at the same time, having a degree of privacy, which keeps them sane. Second, Sandringham, a relative steal at around 50 million. How did she get those particular properties which are allegedly privately owned? She got them because Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, back in the 19th century, went to Parliament, cap in hand, said they hadn't enough money to make ends meet to meet their official expenses. Parliament increased the amount of money they gave to the Queen. She didn't need it at all. What she did was use that extra money to buy Sandringham and Balmoral, which therefore ought to belong to the state. The Queen's personal fortune is an estimated £350 million, which may even be exceeded by Prince Charles's own bulging piggy bank, thanks to his estate, the Duchy of Cornwall. The land that it owns is um, larger than many of uh, Britain's largest cities combined, uh, although it's spread across uh, more than 20 counties across southern England, and it earns in excess of £20 million a year for Prince Charles, and there's no rule that says we have to allow Prince Charles to take that money. It is something which we have uh, permitted over the last 200 years. The management of these trust funds has constantly raised questions as to how the Queen and Prince Charles invest their money. In my time in Parliament, I asked a number of parliamentary questions about the operation of the Duchy of Lancaster, the Duchy of Cornwall and other such matters. Uh, it's very difficult to probe these uh, matters because the duchies, particularly the Duchy of Cornwall actually, are quite secretive and have no wish to expose what they are doing. Sometimes, of course, the truth comes out. Never more so than with the Paradise Papers scandal in 2017. So the Paradise Papers were a large uh, collection of documents leaked uh, to the press, which uh, revealed the tax arrangements and investments, uh, particularly investments in tax havens, of lots of well-known and important people, including Prince Charles and the Queen. Financial documents from a law firm in Bermuda reveal the Queen's advisers decided to invest some of her wealth offshore. Some feel Her Majesty may owe her subjects an apology. It came as a surprise to learn that she had £10 million of her duchy money invested in the Cayman Islands and in Bermuda. Now, the problem with that is that everyone presumed that all her investments were in, were in the UK and in blue-chip companies. It looked as though she was, you know, operating like a city fund manager. One of the Queen's investments had been in a chain accused of irresponsible lending. They feed on the poor. That is where they make their money and the Queen is supposed to look after the people. Now, I don't assume for one minute that the Queen has done this herself, but it will be one somebody who's in her pay, one of her echelons, that will have done this, and it just makes me wonder who we employ to look after our Queen. The Paradise Papers were um, a very interesting revelation. Places like the Cayman Islands were benefiting rather than the UK. Well, you know, the royal family's answer to that was that uh, there was no benefit from investing in these places. If that were the case, then one wonders why they didn't simply put the money in the nearest bank of coats and sit back and relax and get the interest. Questions, too, abounded over Prince Charles's conduct. He leaked documents claim the Prince's estate, the Duchy of Cornwall, bought shares in an offshore company. 
The company wanted to offset carbon from rainforests, but international agreements prevented it. The prince agreed and campaigned to change it. Was that a conflict of interest? Charles could have just said in one of his speeches, listen, I've been banging on about this issue for 20 or 30 years. I feel so strongly about it that I actually put my money where my mouth is and I've invested in a green company. But he didn't say this and it all emerged through a, a splash on the front page of The Guardian and exposed today by Panorama. Even though Charles reportedly has no direct involvement in the Duchy of Cornwall's investments, the vast sums of money behind the monarchy remain a divisive issue. Queen Elizabeth II has reigned for over 65 years, with each significant milestone marked with increasing pomp and circumstance. Even the Silver Jubilee in 1977 was a show of wealth beyond comprehension. Monarchists would argue lavish occasions like this are more than recompensed by the Crown Estate. The Crown Estate is valued at around £14 billion, um, making a profit of around £340 million a year, which goes to the government. It's yet another collection of land and property, including the Queen's preferred schmoozing hub, Windsor Castle. The welcoming head of state was Queen Elizabeth II, as she, President Reagan, Mrs. Reagan, and Prince Philip looked on from the reviewing platform, the Grenadier Guards helped establish once again that no one is better at pomp and ceremony than the British. But there's also other more surprising portfolio particulars, such as Ascot Racecourse and the entirety of Regent Street. And it's not just inland income being generated. The Crown Estate owns all of the seabed, or most of the seabed, around the UK, uh, out to as far as 12 nautical miles. So that's an enormous amount of uh, undersea real estate. The wind power has become the money spinner, quite literally, for the Crown Estate. Well, it's interesting that uh, both Prince Philip and Prince Charles have uh, decried wind turbines and said how dreadful they are. So, you know, all those wind turbines are just churning out cash. But is this contribution to the Treasury rightfully the royal families to make? There's a popular misconception about the Crown Estate. Because of the word crown, most people think it's owned by the Queen. But it isn't. It is public property. All the, all the rental income from the land, all of that goes into the public purse. It's not private, it's ours. The income of the Crown Estate would still come in if we didn't pay for the monarchy. Um, but if people are making that connection, then it, it is a net loss um, to the taxpayer. One constantly cited benefit of the royal family to the UK is the boost to tourism. The latest figures suggest that the royal family boosts British tourism by half a billion pounds a year. 2.7 million people visit Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle on their own, without any encouragement whatsoever. So of course the family is certainly a draw for tourists. The UK's heritage tourism industry is huge and very popular and people go to those houses, those castles, those grand estates because they're interested in the history, not because of the royal family. We only have to look to Tower of London, uh, which the royals haven't been connected with for centuries. It is number nine in the list of the top tourist attractions in the UK. Buckingham Palace is number 68, uh, whereas Windsor Castle is 18. So, you know, these attractions are not the big draw that people think they are, um, and people will still go there. And I imagine in much larger numbers, they would go to Buckingham Palace if it was not being lived in, if you could walk through the front gates, through the courtyard, through the gardens, uh, and through all of the rooms. The third way many believe the royals add value is via the royal brand itself, which covers all those essential milestones the public wants to be part of. I think after George was born, a hundred odd million was spent on people buying related trinkets. Equally, we have jubilees and people want to have street parties. They want to go out and celebrate, so they spend more money on booze, more money on food, more money on coronation chicken. And all through their lives, we may copy what the royals wear or partake of items bearing royal patronage. The royals are like celebrities. When they wear a certain brand of something and we like it, we all want to wear 
that too or have a bit of that too, that royal sparkle. It's estimated through informal endorsements, royal warrants and other media coverage, the royal family added an extra £887 million to the economy. It's been argued that consumers are somehow impressed with or attracted by the royal brand. And again, you know, there is a market for royal brands. There is a market for lots of different brands. But the point is, the monarchy is not there to make us money. It's not there to be a brand. It's there to provide us with a head of state. <laughs> so then, is there a point to suggest that it's impossible to quantify their true value to the nation? The royals have gone through times of great popularity and also there have been downturns in their popularity and I think we do have that two-way relationship that when they're not meeting our needs as a nation, we can get pretty grumpy about that and let them know. For instance, when Diana died and we didn't see the Queen, I think public pressure was on her to change what she did. And the survival of the monarchy is a bit like maintaining tradition, but showing a willingness to be flexible, and that's what we like. Of course, there will always be doubters. The Queen has done her best for this country, and I think most people recognise the effort she's made to discharge her public duties. But the fact of the matter is that the royal family is, through no fault of its own perhaps, unhelpful to this country going forward. We have to recognise that Britain in 2021 20, is not the same country as Britain was in 1921. And the royal family, in that sense, holds us back. Uh, we have to recognise our new role in the world, not pretend that things have not changed. Maybe it simply boils down to the eccentricities of how the British people lead their lives. People often say, well, you know, the monarchy is part of that quirky nature of British life. Uh, but we don't put up with the royals or, or love the royals because of that, um, that quirky nature of the British character. It is because the royals serve a purpose. They're, they serve their own purpose and they serve a purpose for those in power. And so there's constant effort to promote them and to ensure that they are not uh, put under such pressure and such scrutiny as to turn the people against them. It's part of the British culture. And to shift out of that, I think, would take tremendous change and tremendous growing pains. And I don't know that we are yet prepared for that because every time there is a bit of a disruption or a shift, there is often a reaction to that. So Harry and Meghan deciding to step away has caused great consternation. It's like, how could you do that? Which shows the power of the royal family entrenched in the British psyche at the moment. We're told that the royal family is a major asset to this country in terms of the economy. Um, no doubt they bring in some tourism, and no doubt there is a genuine value to some visits carried out by the royal family to overseas destinations and some uh, events hosted at Buckingham Palace. But as to what that is in economic terms, it's almost impossible to quantify. What we do know, with rather more certainty, is how much they cost us. And what we know is that runs into hundreds of millions of pounds each year, and that's m a multiplicity of times more than any other royal family in Europe. Do we get value for money? Yes, I believe we do. And I think when people sit down and analyse what they get in return, they will think, yeah, we do pretty well. So in trying to explain whether or not the royal family are worth it, we shouldn't expect the answer to be based on such a simple thing as reason. the royal family receive is on the up. At the time, an MP famously described it as a golden ratchet. The money would always go up 
but never down. The Royals carry out 3,500 engagements a year. It seems like people are getting a good bang for their buck. But in an uncertain financial climate... This is a huge amount of money draining away from the public purse. With all the private planes, trains and pimped-up automobiles, well, the Queen is the most travel monarch in all history. Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip board a plane for the 30,000-mile tour around the world. Not to mention the pomp. The royals are like celebrities. When they wear a certain brand of something and we like it, we all want to wear that too or have a bit of that too, that royal sparkle. Palaces. How did she get those? particular properties which are allegedly privately owned. She got them because Queen Victoria and Prince Albert went to Parliament cap in hands. Parliament increased the amount of money they gave to the Queen. What she did was use that extra money to buy Sandringham and Balmoral, which therefore ought to belong to the state. And pageantry that comes with the territory. One of the things that about Elizabeth that I've never seen contradicted is the sense that she puts duty first almost to an, an insane degree. Are they truly worth it? It's a bad deal for, in terms of value for money and the taxpayer getting ripped off.